Welcome to a special series of This Week in Canton City Schools, where we'll focus on the mental health and wellness of our kids and families. I'm Jacqueline Power, the broadcast media instructor here at the Timken Career Campus of McKinley High School and your host today. The Canton City School District continues to partner with the Child and Adolescent Behavioral Health Agency. This agency provides a myriad of resources to the Stark County community and most importantly to our students within CCSD. Each month we will feature resources and strategies to help the mental well-being of our young people. On this episode, we are talking with Mary Kreitz, agency trainer, and we will discuss the balance of social interactions with the time you spend alone. Sit tight, all of that starts right now. As we continue to look for ways to balance the demands of day-to-day -day life and the obstacles we can face, our mental health and wellness continues to be at the forefront of the needs of our young people. This continued series of shows with the Child and Adolescent Behavioral Health Agency will provide all kinds of different ways to address the needs of our youth in regards to mental health and wellness. On today's show, we are joined today by Child and Adolescent Behavioral Health's trauma lead therapist, Mary Kreitz. Welcome back to the studio. We appreciate you being here. I understand that you've been with the agency for more than 20 years. Tell our viewers a little bit about the various roles you've had at CNA over the years. Okay, well, I'm a therapist and I've done a lot of different things at Child and Adolescent. So I've done office-based work, uh, school-based work. I've worked in the community, going out to people's homes. Um, for seven years, I worked in our day treatment program, our trauma-informed day treatment program. I had the youngest classroom, so the kindergarten through third graders. And um, I worked in our groups program, doing groups and even camps over the summer. And currently, I am the lead for trauma therapy. Mm -hmm. And I do a lot of office-based office work, and I also work with the children through the Children's Network. That's one heck of a resume. <laughs> you are one busy lady <laughs> with all kinds of, um, with that kind of background, like the diversity of everything you've been able to do is pretty incredible. Thank you. So transitioning to our actual discussion topic, um, which is on loneliness today, can you define what loneliness is for our viewers? Well, loneliness is about feeling that the the quantity and the quality of social connections mm -hmm. is not meeting what you need. And so basically it's, it's feeling kind of a lack that you just don't have the connection where you really feel like you belong somewhere. Or it could be that um, sometimes there is a, a really specific kind of loneliness, like after you've had a breakup or after someone dies, you might be lonely because you're missing a specific person mm -hmm. and you really just don't find that same connection with anyone else that you had with them. So hearing that definition, many individuals can be surrounded by family and friends or at social gatherings and still feel lonely. Um, and this is challenging sometimes for people to really understand how that's possible. So can you please explain how an individual can be in a room surrounded by people and still feel lonely? Well, it's probably happened to everyone at some point because honestly, anyone could feel lonely. It happens to all of us for short mm -hmm. periods of time. But you could be in a crowded room and not really know any of the people there or not feel like these are my people, the people that get me. Like um, if you've ever been in a room where people have a lot of like inside jokes or um, a lot of shared history and you don't have to explain what you mean when you're referring to things that happened in the past. That's a really good feeling but when you are outside of that and you don't have that shared history or you're around other people that do and you don't get their jokes or you don't people have to explain what they mean yeah. when they're referring to past things that can leave you feeling very lonely and isolated or sometimes when you're um, again when you're missing someone specific you might be surrounded by a whole lot of people and you're having that thought in your head oh I would just love to tell them about this yeah. but that person isn't there with you yeah. and so it can feel just that disconnection and that isolation that even though there's people around me I'm still kind of floating on my own in this room and that can be really hard for people to deal with 
Absolutely, I've been in situations where I didn't know a lot of people, like there might be an entire auditorium full of people, right. or you go and you watch a show and there's not a single person, maybe the person you went with, but then that person you went with knows all these other people and now you feel like, okay, I'm on an island all by myself, I don't know these people and it just, it feels strange. I've always called it it's a strange inner feeling, I guess I didn't realize it was like a feeling of loneliness, but I can... Well, uh, that's, that's just it, a lot of times we have it and we don't realize that mm -hmm. this is actually what I'm experiencing. I am lonely right now, or I am lonely for you right now because you're seeing a show and you go, oh, this person would have loved that joke, yeah. or oh, they would, they would remember this thing that it reminded me of, but they're not there to share that with them. And so it can leave you just feeling lonely yeah it's kind of this empty little like pit in your stomach so that makes perfect sense so I have read some statistics um, provided uh, to me which are some staggering somewhat staggering um, but in light uh, in, yeah, of recent events during the past few years seem kind of logical so in 2021 half of Americans reported having three close friends up to 27 percent um, from 1990 uh, in 2018, 16% of Americans reported feeling attached to their local community. And in 2020, less than half of Americans reported belonging to a religious or faith-based community, down 70% from the year 1999. So what are your feelings as to why these numbers are kind of taking place? And then what are we able to do to maybe reverse this trend? Because I know, at least for me personally, and being a mom and working in the school setting, COVID, I was just having this conversation with someone, it was either today or yesterday, I can't, oh, yesterday, with one of my moms, um, students in my classroom, and she was saying like how her child had changed. I mean, there's just the dynamics of that child have completely changed when it comes to social interaction. So I feel like those statistics help us understand a little bit of some of those switches that have happened and then kind of what can we be doing to I hate to use the word get back to something, but I mean, mm -hmm. in, real, in reality, that's, that's what we're kind of talking about. Well, and there's really a couple of things going on here. Um, one is that COVID absolutely disrupted our social interactions. We right. didn't have opportunities to get out and interact with people. And because of that, we also had a lot of relationships that kind of withered because we just didn't stay in contact with people as much as we might have in the past. And even those incidental running across somebody at the mall or at a party right. that maybe you hadn't planned to see them, but you strike up a conversation because you happen to be in the same place yeah. at the same time. Um, so a lot of those things happened, and especially for kids who are still developing their social skills, they might not have had that practice of being able to strike up a conversation easily with someone they don't know very well. And so that makes it even harder on them. They might not have had all the opportunities to join activities or clubs so that they have opportunities to go somewhere and be around other people that share interests with them. And that makes it harder. And then just overall, we have a trend of becoming more and more isolated in our culture that's gone way beyond just what happened because of COVID. And honestly, some of it is an artifact of technology. Yeah. Because like um, when air conditioning started to become more commonly used in our houses, people used to sit out on their porch or on their doorstep and talk to their neighbors. Yeah, because yeah, right. you'd be outside on a summer night and it's a little bit cooler than being in a hot, stuffy house. Other people are around, you just naturally strike up conversations. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, we can go inside our house, close the door, and never talk to our neighbors. Or a lot of us now have automatic garage door openers. So we can just open the garage to our attached garage and go in through a door inside the garage. You don't even have to see your neighbors. Um, houses that are a little older used to have the detached garage, so you at yep. least had that walk from your garage to your house. Um, but some of those things make it so that we have less frequent face-to-face -face contact with people. Mm -hmm. We have more technology so that 
we can just send a quick text and not have to hear another person's voice. And sometimes that's a wonderful convenience because you don't need a whole conversation. I just need to know real quick, do we need more eggs? <laughs> and I can send a quick text right. to find that out. Um, but sometimes it gives us less chances to actually interact Correct. with people and foster those connections that we get by being face to face with each other. And so we have lost some of those chances to just really feel connected and part of a yeah. family or a community. And so it's, it's happened slowly over time. So then what do we do to try to right. overcome this? There's a lot of different things that we can do. And keeping in mind that social interactions are always two ways. So part of it is on the individual that's feeling lonely to reach out and be open to talking to other people, smiling at people and seeming approachable. Yeah. Some of it is on the other person to also be willing to reciprocate and to notice when somebody maybe seems a little down or blue and ask about it or to know about situations that might cause a person to feel lonely. So you know someone has had a breakup lately or you know that their really good friend has moved and isn't around. Yeah. So reaching out to say, hey, would you like to come with us? We're going to a movie tonight. Or just checking in, hey, how are you doing? And another thing we can really do is listen. A lot of us have lost our listening skills. We listen trying to think of what is the clever thing I'm going to say next or how in the world am I going to answer this question and instead what we really need to do is listen like what is this person trying to tell me and beyond just the actual words what feelings am I picking yeah, up listen to them? hear not listen to respond right right and it makes a difference because on the receiving end of that, when someone is really listening to you, you feel that difference. Mm -hmm. You feel more of a connection to them and an appreciation from them. And that fosters friendship. And so we really have to do both of those things. We have to be willing to extend ourselves and put ourselves out there, which is always a risk because somebody might not be interested to talk to you or might not have time to talk. Right. Um, but then also to be willing to put things aside, put the phone down, stop whatever we're doing, pause, and really listen be to the this moment. other person. Yeah, to be present with them makes a huge difference. Hopefully those that tide can kind of turn and that we can get back to, um, and I tell my children that, I tell my fiance that, I'm always like, okay, this is the moment I need you to listen to hear me not listen to respond to me per se, but like really hear what I'm saying or I just won't say it. Yeah. <laughs> like what's the point of saying it if you're not really listening to me? <laughs> so true. So, so true. Um, kind of turning the conversation to adolescence, redefine a couple of ideas. Is it okay for teenagers and adults to have alone time? So is that an okay thing? Absolutely. Everyone needs alone time. We all need it from time to time. The difference is how much. And that even varies from person to person because there are some people who are extroverts and they draw energy from being around other people. It gets them going. But then there are other people that are introverts and being around other people might be enjoyable, but it's also draining. And so they need some time alone to recharge afterward. And that's totally okay. What you really want to look out for, though, are the people that are isolating themselves too much. So they're spending all of their time alone. Or when they're around other people, they're not really interacting. They're like in their phone or in a book and not really talking to anybody. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been there myself. I have been in the room with my family and everybody is on their device and nobody's really talking. But if you asked anybody, we would have all said, oh yeah, we spent time together this evening. Sometimes it's just, let's put all the things down and let's play a game together. Um, recently, this past weekend, my nephew got out his Monopoly board and we sat around and had an amazing time just buying up every property on Monopoly and having a great time together. And interacting with each other, not just breathing the air next to each other while we interact with our devices. That can make a huge difference of, of making a family really feel like a family, not just people that 
live in a house together, you know? Teenagers need that. And it, adolescence is a time when naturally you're moving away from the core family and friendships with peers become more important. So some of that is natural that they're going to want to go out and do things with their friends or they're going to want to be on their their devices texting and messaging with their friends. And we need to allow them to do that because that is a natural part of life that they should be going through. But we also need to make them aware that, hey, your family's still here and we love you and we want to spend time with you. So once in a while, hang out with us. It'd be great. We would love to see you and talk to you. Because I feel like my, so I have an eighth grader and I have a sophomore and then I have stepkids that have since graduated from high school and they're like living their best lives elsewhere, right? So my eighth grader at home with her being the youngest of all the kids, she would live in her room. Like if I brought her dinner to her room for her, she would never leave her bedroom. So I don't want to push too much. Like, so from a mom's perspective, I have... My, and she was at one point this bubbly, like come out of her room all the time, like had to be sitting on the couch with me, couldn't be more than a foot away from me, no <laughs> personal space to now like a complete 180 to where, I mean, if I talk to her, she will talk to me. Mm -hmm. She still wants like hugs and wants to see me, but it just seems like she wants to spend, she wants to practically live in her room. So as a mom, what kind of suggestions do you have for other moms like me, especially because that's that transitional time because she's a little, she's a girl, so she's transitioning from being this, you know, little girl into more of the adolescent she's going to be when she starts high school. So advice? Well, <laughs> honestly, one of the things is to go to her. Mm -hmm. Instead of expecting her to come to you on the couch, yeah. go to her room. If she's watching something, hey, can I come in and watch with you? Or, hey, can we sit down and talk about this? And meet her where she's comfortable. Okay. And, it's and not also, invading her personal space. I always well, feel like, I don't know. I don't know where the line is, so. And honestly, <laughs> let her define the line. Ask, okay. can I come in and talk to you? Is this a good time? Or, hey, I'm missing you. Can we watch a movie together? Yeah. But approaching her about it rather than making her come to you. And she'll tell you the boundary of what's okay. comfortable for her <laughs> because anybody else can't really define what's going to be comfortable for her. She's her own individual. Yeah. But by eighth grade, they're usually pretty good at saying, oh, no, mom, I'm busy with this or, okay. hey, yeah, come on in. And it might be that instead of sitting on the couch two inches from you, you sit on the bed or on the floor together and you're yeah. still sharing the experience and spending the time together. The other thing is to really look for quality interaction, not necessarily quantity, quantity. Okay. because we can still feel really close to people. And I know you've probably experienced this. After a five-minute conversation, sometimes you just feel really close. And sometimes you can spend a whole afternoon with someone and still feel like, I don't really yeah, know them. Right, <laughs> right. You know? So it, you look for those quality interactions, those, those times when you can just put everything down and really be in, in that moment together. So kind of along those lines, for parents trying to figure out if their child is lonely, uh, what is the difference between being shy and then socially introverted and lonely in okay. general? So shy means that there's some bit of anxiety that comes mm -hmm. up, that either you worry about how you're going to be in social situations or that when those social situations up, you get that kind of almost panic feeling of, what are people going to think of me? Or am I going to be able to say the right thing? Or will I do something embarrassing? Um, and often because those unpleasant feelings come up, people shut down and they just don't want to say anything. Um, sometimes people get it to such an extreme that they experience kind of a freeze reaction where they literally, their mind goes blank and they can't think of anything to say, or they say something and it comes out sounding really awkward and weird. Mm -hmm. And that just reinforces that I'm not good in social situations. So I'm going to be even more reluctant to go into them next yeah. time. That's shyness. Um, introversion, as I said before, is more of a where do you go to recharge your battery? And some people need more alone time to be able to recharge. That doesn't mean they don't have social skills or that they don't enjoy interacting with other people. I'm actually a very introverted person. 
but I talk a lot. Right. Exactly the <laughs> you know? same. I need time for like just for my brain to decompress. Yes. That's what I try to explain to my family. That same kind of feeling of like, believe it or not, everything that I do as far as my career, like I love my students, I love my profession, I still love doing everything that I get to do in media, but there are some days like I just, I don't want to people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes I just need a minute to collect my thoughts and then I'll be ready to go again. Yes. But that's, it's more of just your style of being okay. and your way of recharging yourself. And really there's nothing wrong with it as long as we can recognize that my style might not be the same as someone else's. And so I have to respect what they need and I am gonna ask them to respect what I need. We can find a good balance there. There was a third one you asked about, and I don't remember what yeah, it was. Yeah, um, <laughs> just overall loneliness, I think. Yeah, so we've got being shy, socially introverted, and lonely. Okay, lonely then goes to that point of where you're interacting with people, but the needs that we have, and we do have a need for social connection. It's as basic to human beings as our need for food and shelter and um, safety we need to feel that there's another person on the planet that recognizes we exist yeah. and that that person cares that someone would notice whether i'm here tomorrow or not yeah. um, we need that and if we don't feel that need being met we start to feel lonely and so that's where we have to then look at both the quality of our interactions mm -hmm. are there people that I'm making that good connection with, mm -hmm. and are there enough opportunities so that if I'm not making that, that I have a chance to maybe develop that out of some of the connections that I have. And it, it comes easier sometimes than others. Sometimes yeah. we meet people and we just click right away and it's easy to form a connection. And sometimes we meet people and we don't really have a lot in common. And so it just doesn't really click. That's what it is. <laughs> and that's totally okay. It's all right. You, you aren't gonna be able to please everyone all the time. And it's, it's fine because there's other people that you will. So is an increase, and maybe we did talk a little bit, you mentioned the cell phones and how that is. I know my dad freaks out about them all the time. He's like, <laughs> put them away. Social media, video gaming leading to kind of more loneliness among young people or youth? It really is. Um, there's some research showing that social media use actually becomes like an addiction mm -hmm. where the more that you're on it the more that you crave it when you're off of it okay. and it's occupying more of our time and because of that we're having less of those face-to-face -face interactions mm -hmm. and also we're looking at other people and comparing ourselves mm -hmm. to what do we see in people's photos and their profiles and we look at them and go I don't have that it's not necessarily accurate that they have it either, but that's the image that they're projecting. And sometimes because we, d we see the image and we believe that that must be what they're like all the time. They're always happy. And we see those pictures of couples that are just gazing into each other's eyes. And we go, well, I don't have that with my boyfriend. Um, or we see you know, the happy family sitting around the table together yeah. and everybody's smiling and passing. It's like the commercials. Yes. I mean, that's how you feel like it is sometimes. Yeah. And then you look at your real life and, uh, you know, my family's not sitting around the table passing mashed potatoes with a smile. They're all complaining and somebody's saying something awkward and <laughs> it's just like, oh, when can we be done? <laughs> right. I just want to be done with this social situation. Right. Yeah. So sometimes that perception isn't reality for the perception you think it is anyway. Right. So um, I know with video games and things like that, I know that was a very 90s thing when I was growing up, that video games were like the very first before social media was ever a thing that parents were always really concerned about. So do we feel like that can, has contributed at all to kids feeling lonely? Or maybe now that like you're connected through the game, I don't know. It, it can actually go both ways. Okay. For some kids, they meet other people through their games mm -hmm. and they feel a real connection with them because they have some shared interests. And maybe the other people that are around them in their family or in their neighborhood, in their school, don't share their interests or they mm -hmm. don't really feel like they get them the way that their friends through gaming do. And so that can be a really good thing for them. There's other people though that are playing their games and it's 
so hyper competitive and so anger inducing that they're not walking away feeling really connected to people. They're feeling almost hostile toward people and that is where it can be dangerous. Or they're, it's them against everyone and everybody is not your opponent. That sometimes in the world we're actually on the same team. <laughs> it's okay, you know. Um, but sometimes people are so used to being in that opposition, well, opposition meaning opponents, not yeah. defiance kind, yeah. kind of thing. But they're, they're in that mindset and they have a hard time turning it off mm -hmm. and realizing that, oh, every interaction isn't that type of interaction. And it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. So for students, uh, wintertime can sometimes bring along seasonal depression. I feel like even beyond students, like I think we all can kind of experience a little bit of that. Uh, it's often cold. It's dark so early. I mean, the sun sets like 4.30 in the afternoon. Um, there are more breaks in the school calendar, longer weekends, so your routines are kind of messed up. How do these breaks in routine contribute to loneliness for adolescents who might not have that strong family connection? Mm -hmm. Well, to go back to the seasonal affective, that is a real thing. That the decreased amounts of sunlight can cause us to have some feelings of sadness, depression, feeling just fatigued and tired all the time. That gives us, especially for people who need a little more energy to make the initiation of a social interaction, it makes us less likely to want to go and do things. Yeah. And so that can be a real problem. And so people need to make an effort to actually get out in the sunshine and absorb some of those mm -hmm. those rays that actually help us to feel a little bit better it evens out our moods um, and then all the disruptions to the schedules can actually make it hard for us to really have those connections because when you're when you're stuck at home and you don't have a family that you get along with or you're stuck at home and there's no one else around because maybe you're the only one home, other people are out at jobs or doing right. other things, that can feel really isolating. And so that can be, you know, really tough and we have to kind of look at what are our other options that are out mm -hmm. there. So sometimes we have to be more intentional to set up times to meet up with somebody or to do those things that we did during COVID of um, FaceTiming or, you know, video chatting with somebody, setting up a time. Um, I know a lot of us did it where we would set up a time to watch a video together with somebody while we're yeah. on a, a video call or on a uh, phone call with someone just to reach out and feel that connection. But the other thing that we can do is to take that time to feel comfortable being with ourselves. Because sometimes we can look for other people to make us feel good about ourselves. We could look inside and learn to really enjoy spending time with ourselves. So get a book and read a book or do some drawing or journaling. Whatever activity it is that you enjoy doing, can you spend some time just doing that and really enjoying that activity? Right. And not always needing someone else to entertain us or to keep us company. That sometimes we are really good company just for our own selves. I feel like I'm going to give this episode to my fiance, <laughs> who I feel like he needs an entertainment committee 24 seven. And I tried to explain to him, not your entertainment committee, right. find something that you can do that brings you internal peace so that I get that quiet time I need yes. and you can have some quiet one on one time too. So how do these lonely feelings affect um, a student's physical and mental health? And could this lead to more serious consequences such as the suicide ideation? Yeah, um, earlier this year, the Surgeon General, uh, Dr. Murphy, Murthy, released a report that was really staggering with some of the information in there on connections between physical health and loneliness. That again, people have periods of loneliness, that's normal, it can affect anybody. But when you have prolonged loneliness, when people are feeling that way for weeks and months, it starts to take a toll on our physical health and they found that it was associated with a higher risk for heart disease, cancer, stomach ailments, um, and actually dementia, there was a 50% greater chance of dementia among older adults who have chronic loneliness. Um, people 
they actually found that the um, association between isolation and loneliness and a shortened lifespan is the same as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Like, that's a lot. <laughs> that, and that's wild that those two things would even be on the same plane, right. let alone be causal relationships right. that mirror each other. It, it's amazing, it, just staggering research when you find that. And then you mentioned suicide. One of the strongest risk factors for suicide is isolation. That sense that I'm by myself, no one cares, no one understands. Mm -hmm. um, and if you add on to that other factors such as a person feeling like they're not a success in their life or feeling like they're a burden on others, mm -hmm. it puts people at a really high risk of feeling like they want to end their life. Mm -hmm. And so suicide does become a high risk for people that are isolated for prolonged periods of time. And we really, that's why we need to reach out to each other and make sure that we're checking in with people, especially our people that might be living alone or people who are living with other people that they don't necessarily get along with or feel a strong connection to. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that we're reaching out in some way, whether that's visiting face to face, giving a phone call, even just a text to say, hey, I'm thinking about you, because we want to remind them that there are people who do care and people that they do have that connection with. And so it's super important. It can, in fact, be life-saving to reach out and make those connections. Yeah, it sounds like it really, really, truly is. So what are some important numbers for our families to keep in mind if a family member is struggling? Okay, so if someone is struggling, they can call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 988, that's the National Suicide and Crisis Hotline. Okay. They can also text to that line or they can text to 741741. If you text the words for the number four and the word hope, H-O-P-E, then someone will respond back with a text right away and be able to give some support. Um, they can also reach out to Child and Adolescent Behavioral Health. We're yes. at 330-433-6075. And we are absolutely there to help people out when they need a little more professional help. I think that's great. So to flip the script a little bit, um, the opposite of isolation and feeling of loneliness is obviously some type of social interaction. So let's define a social connection or what that means. Okay, a social connection is, like you said, it's kind of the opposite of loneliness. It's when you feel that you have a connection with another person that satisfies that need for feeling understood and feeling like you belong somewhere. And that connection could be with an individual or it could be with a group or a community. So sometimes people feel those kind of connections maybe with their church or with a sports team. Things like that can be a really good source of social connection. And then um, what are the benefits of social connections? Social connections have so many benefits. It does a lot for an individual to increase our mood, to actually give us a little bit of that buffer against some of those health risks that I mentioned earlier. It can help just to restore our sense of hope and optimism in life. For communities, having those social connections are actually really beneficial because um, communities where people feel a stronger sense of connection with other members of their community actually tend to be safer communities. There's less crime, less um, threats to people's safety in those communities. Mm -hmm. And it's really kind of a neat re reciprocal process that when a community has a lot of connections and a person feels connected to that community, they're more likely to be active participants in the community and yeah. to take an active role in building the very structures that help people to feel connected, yeah. which then reaches out to other people and causes that same kind of effect. So you're both contributing to those connections and benefiting from them. And it's a really amazing thing once you get that rolling, how quickly it spreads so that people are feeling more of that sense of belonging and companionship. Which is absolutely key. So what is the first step um, to recommend for individuals to be less lonely and work to be more connected? Really the first step is to reach out. Um, you want to just look for those opportunities of 
where might I find other people that maybe have something in common with me, whether it's a, a shared interest or just that we're in the same space together on a re regular basis or a frequent basis. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it comes up in the most unexpected ways. Um, recently, I went to see a speech at the Palace Theater uh -huh. from an author, the library sponsored this author coming in and, and speaking and I started talking with the woman sitting next to me and it turned out that she was just a, a amazing person and also a member of the Stark Library Foundation and in talking about it and talking about how much libraries have played an important role in our life she was like would you actually be interested in joining the Library Foundation and I said I really would be. This would be great. This is something that is very important to me and has yeah. played an important role in my life. So she invited me to coffee with her and some other members of the foundation and we had a great chat then. And then I went to my first library foundation meeting yesterday and it was wonderful. And when I got there, I sat down next to a woman that I've never met before and she just leaned over and said, hi. I don't know you. Welcome to the Library Foundation. And it was so nice and friendly. And again, we have things that are common interests and common values, and it was very easy to strike up a conversation with her. In that common her. space. So you already knew you had common interests. You already knew that you had some crossover yes. into the things that are meaningful to you, and you were able to absolutely have an authentic conversation around those things you already knew you shared in common. And it is just taking that risk to look over and say hello to someone and start up that conversation. And then you discover all sorts of possibilities. It was, it's great. I feel like you've given us a ton of information and some of the important information I don't want our viewers to miss out on before we close out. So um, text lines, you mentioned a couple of text lines that okay. if you need to reach out, so can we have those one more time? Okay, um, first off the national Cri suicide and Crisis Lifeline, you can call or text to 988 and connect with a professional right away who okay. is going to be able to offer hope. There's also a text line that is, if you send a text to 741741 and you want to text the number 4 followed by the word HOPE, H-O-P-E, and then there will be a person that will text back right away willing to talk to you about whatever crisis you're experiencing and it also those resources are available if you're maybe not the person in crisis but you're worried about someone else okay you can call and they will walk you through what to do to reach out to help that person so those are resources that people can absolutely they're free and they're available all the time and they're just phenomenal resources to help out well, you have been a phenomenal resource today. Congratulations so on being added to your new committee. You seem really excited about it. I so it, about I think it's, um, yeah, my oldest daughter is an avid reader and I order books for her all the time. And she absolutely would be all about, from her volleyball side of her personality to she's absolutely love in love with a good story. So yes. I feel like that's um, fantastic to be able to share some of those experiences with people. So thank you, thank you. Anything you wanted to add that maybe I skipped over over. Did we cover everything today? I feel like we covered. We covered a lot. I think yeah. we did. You're absolutely right. So thank you so much for being here. Appreciate all that information, all the resources. And then for more information on this topic and so many more, you can visit the CNA website, www.childandadolescent.org, or you can call the CNA office at 330-433-6075. Thanks to Dan Mucci, Mission Advancement Director, for helping coordinate this episode and all future episodes in this partnership and our past episodes. As for the TV11 staff, we'll continue to bring you an inside look at the district each week during the regular school year, in addition to this series of shows on mental health and wellness. So if you're a staff member and would like to have a feature story on our program, please email me at power underscore j at ccsdistrict.org. We'd love to have you into the studio to showcase the valuable experiences our kids have here at the Kansas City School District and the supports we have in place to educate the whole child. Please visit our website at ccstv11.com where you can get information on all of our shows and watch us on your favorite device. We will see you next time.